if you will, to Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. <clears throat> All of you are familiar with this. I'll begin with verse 6 and read through verse 8. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes shall inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Now watch verse 8. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters, now this one, and all liars. Their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I've heard so many lies <clears throat> that I couldn't help but think about the subject of liars. And you don't hear it discussed very much today. <clears throat> and I think there is a reason for that. All liars. What is the word that is used here? Well, I thought I would look into it. I've gathered the information. I'm going to work it up later. But I just jotted down three pages of Greek words... And folks, there are a total of 15 different Greek words used in the study of the subject of liars. Fifteen Greek words. I'm not going to give them all to you, but I am going to give you kind of an, an overview of what I want to study and bring before long because I think it is a subject that is applicable for the time in which we live. The basic word to remember in the study of this subject is pseudo. Pseudo. That's the verb form. You'll also find it in some Greek dictionaries as pseudomai. An oh my verb rather than an omega verb. Same. And I won't go into the difference now. But they're the same. <clears throat> but I wanted to mention that in case you start looking it up. That's the major verb. And what does it mean? It means to deceive, pseudo. So you see, think of the very prefix of this verb, pseudo. Pseudomai <clears throat> means to deceive. If it is being used in the middle voice in the Greek, it means to speak falsely or deceitfully. Now, from this one verb, we have uh, the derivation of several words that I have mentioned. And I want to give uh, some of them to show you the importance of this study. For example, <clears throat> pseudes which means either liar or false, is used three times in the New Testament. And by the way, that is the word that is used in Revelation 21.8, pseudes. So it comes from pseudomai or pseudo. And secondly, we have another word, and it is pseudos. And uh, it means a lie or the lie. The lie. With great emphasis on it. And that is the word that is used in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 11. 
And that's a verse that you want to keep in mind with Revelation 21, verse 8. It is also the word that is used when speaking of Satan himself in John 8 and verse 44. For he is the liar, or a liar, and the father of lies. And so it's also used in that verse. It's used a total of eight times in the New Testament. So that's two that have derived from pseudomai. And then there is still another, and it is pseuma which means lie. And finally, pesustes, pesustes means a liar or the liar. So now I want to give you the compound use. And this is really interesting. For instance, uh, the word autophos is the word for brother. When you put Pseuda in front of it, what do you have? False brethren. So, folks, there are false brethren. Not all who claim to be true brethren are brethren. There are false brethren. And I won't give you all the scriptures on this. I'm just giving you a rundown and show you how big the subject is. And I think one that is very important for the times in which we live. Then there is one. Uh, compound, and it is the prefix uh, that is of this uh, compound word. And the word is the word for apostle, apostolos. But when you put the pseudo in front of it, or pseuda, what do you have? You have false uh, apostles. And there are false apostles. We're in the apostles' times. And then you have this daskalos, is the word for teacher. And it's also used with the pseudo in front of it. And what do you have? False teachers. So you see, you don't think of a liar, folks, as a child who has been asked, did you get in a cooking, did you get in the cookie jar? No, and he has cookies all over his mouth. <laughs> it, that's not what he's talking about. And you know, what has really gotten me and I think it has you, when you listen to the news today and you hear people just tell a lie, you can see the cookies all over their mouth. <laughs> all you have to do is you just look and listen closely. And uh, there are a number of other words, but I won't go into all of them this morning. But, for instance, listen to this one. You know, the word martyria, that means a witness. But when you put pseudo, you have a false witness. So we have false witnesses. We have false apostles. We have false teachers. We have false brethren. And all of this is wrapped up really in the word liar. So what does it mean when it says all liars? Now Abraham lied about his wife. He was fearful of what the king would do. And this is your wife. No, she's not my wife. He lied. Well, he paid for his lie. All Christians will pay for their lying. But they're not liars in the sense of being false witnesses or false Christians. So there are true Christians that lie. And all of us have been, and don't call it a little white lie. A lie is a lie. Nothing white about it. So you can see what an interesting subject this would be to study. And children need to understand this and know this. But I won't uh, get into it this morning, but I've listened to enough in the last two weeks just in listening at uh, the news a few times during the day that uh, has made me want to pursue a study of that subject to the extent that I never have before. And uh, it's easier for me to do it now than it was 50 years ago. I can sit down now and take my concordance, collect all the words together, 
and then my mind is literally filled with instances and verses that just come and enable me to put it together. Open your Bibles this morning, please, to the 135th division of the Psalms. I want to read the chapter and then we'll have someone to lead us in prayer before we go into the exposition of the lesson this morning. As we continue our study of the subject, God is sovereign, which means he's in full control. In the 135th division of the Psalms, our text is going to be, if I were using a text, my subject is really drawn from verse 6. But I want us to look at the entire 135th division of the Psalms. I'm reading from the NASB. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise Him, O servants of the Lord. You who stand in the house of the Lord. In the courts of the house of our God. Sing praises to His name. For it is lovely. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his own possession. So notice, he's chosen Jacob, Israel for his possession. For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Now for the text. Whatever the Lord pleases, He does. Do we believe that? I believe it. Every word of it. Now let's look at the first part and then complete the verse. Whatever the Lord pleases, He does. In heaven and in earth in the seas and all deeps. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth, who makes lightnings for the rain, who brings forth the wind from the treasures. I haven't heard anybody any weatherman who spends a lot of time these days talking about El Nino say anything about who's in control. Here it is. He smote the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. He sent signs and wonders into your midst, O Egypt. Upon Pharaoh and all his servants, he smote many nations and slew mighty kings. What? He slew them. Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan. And he gave their land as a heritage a heritage to Israel, his people. Thy name, O Lord, is everlasting. Thy remembrance, O Lord, throughout all generations. For the Lord will judge his people and will have compassion on his servants. The idols of the nations are but silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Watch this passage. They have eyes, but they do not see. 
They have ears, but they do not hear, nor is there any breath at all in their mouths. Those who make them will be like them. Yes, everyone who trusts in them. O house of Israel, bless the Lord. O house of Aaron, bless the Lord. Watch what he's doing here. Think about the tabernacle and what all these three verses encompasses, if you will, please. O house of Levi, bless the Lord. You who revere the Lord, bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord from Zion, who dwells in Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Now let's begin our exposition of God is in control of all things. I adore the one who, re who reigns in every facet of man's existence, who reigns in every aspect of his providence. We're talking about the supremacy of God. God's supremacy over the works of his hands is vividly depicted in Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. Inanimate matter, watch what I said. Irrational creatures, then you might put in parentheses, without reason. And wicked men, in parentheses again, with depraved reasoning. Now let's go back. Inanimate matter, irrational creatures, and wicked men, perform God's eternal purpose. I think we need to take a breath at that point and let that soak in in these days in which we're living. Let's illustrate it. At God's command, the Red Sea divided and the water stood up like walls. Exodus 14. The earth opened her mouth and guilty rebels were swallowed. Number 16. The sun stood still. Joshua 10. And the fire did not consume the three Hebrews Daniel chapter 3. All of these things happen at God's command. Is he in control? At God's orders, the ravens carried food to Elijah, 1 Kings 17. And the lions were tamed when Daniel was cast into their den. Daniel chapter 6. Wicked men slew the Lord of glory when he came from heaven to earth. Acts chapter 2 verse 23. Thus, watch it, whatever the Lord pleases, he does. He does. The Red Sea was both a deliverance and a judgment. It was a deliverance for God's people and a judgment for his enemies and their enemies. That which appeared to be Israel's destruction became her great blessing. Thus the Red Sea was Israel's deliverance, but it was Pharaoh's army's destruction. 
Do we believe those things? Can God do the same today? The Lord said, Stand still, fear not, and see the deliverance of the Lord. Exodus 14, 13. Fear not, Abraham. I am thy shield an exceeding great reward. Genesis 15, 1. Christ's message to you and me, folks, this is what I've given you, is in the Old Testament. But what about you and me? Let's turn to the New Testament and see what the Lord is saying to you and me today. Here it is. During our Lord's ministry, in Luke 12 and verse 32, he said, Fear not, little flock. Don't forget that expression, little flock. And folks, it's always been small. And it always will be small in comparison. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give to you the kingdom. And He's going to give it to us. It hasn't been established yet. But when it's established by the coming of the King, He'll give it to you and me. We will be part of it. Now, this will be God's message for the remnant of Israel. I'm now drawing from Romans 11. We're in New Testament times now. And so it will be the remnant of Israel's kingdom in a coming day. I said in a coming day. Thus he said... Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense. He will come and deliver you. Isaiah 35 and verse 4, which is a prophecy that God gave through Isaiah to the Israelites at that time. Now let's think about the word fear. Fear and faith are two emotions which govern, they are governed by sense. Faith is a spiritual power, but fear is governed by by our emotions. We're not to be a fearful people. So fear too often gets the advantage over faith. Has that ever happened to you? I said fear gets advantage over faith. Now this is applicable for us now. <clears throat> by considering present interests. What is your interest? What is your interest? Our interest should always be to please God, either in life or in death. Let's put it right where it belongs. Although faith is above feeling, it is not opposed to feeling. It works through feeling and makes it subordinate to it. Hence, what appeared to be Israel's defeat turned out to be Israel's great victory. You and I can experience the same as we walk through our period of time allotted us in fear and trembling. Fear lest we displease our Heavenly Father. Trembling because we do not want to displease Him. 
Let's go back to Israel for a moment. <clears throat> During Israel's period of wandering, and I want to stress the word wandering, we as Christians find ourselves wandering too much. So during Israel's period of wandering, Korah became a leader of rebels against Moses and Aaron, saying, now watch this, in number 16.3, you take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, <clears throat> every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift you up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. Why are you taking so much responsibility upon yourselves? The sin of the rebels was dissatisfaction with God's appointed order of government. You know what's wrong today in the churches? Discontent with God's order of government. That's it. Pure and simple. So the sin of the rebels was their dissatisfaction of appointed government. They were rebellious against God's providence. I said against God's providence. And today, people are rebelling against God's providence even in his government, in the local aspects of his assembly that he continues to build. They were rebellious against God's providence then, and people are rebellious against God's providence now. A proof of this is found in Romans 16, 17, and 18 for a New Testament example, and also Acts 20, Verses 29 through 31. It is interesting to observe that the revolt by the rebels came from those who had favored positions. Isn't that sad? But it's true. The usual case is that leaders in rebellion gain prominence by being bold enough to voice what is already in the minds of many of the people in the various assemblies. Can you, can you relate with experiences that you have had in your lifetime that will harmonize with that? So, what do we have? Korah was aided by Dathan, Abiram, and 250 princes who were, notice this word, famous, and secondly, and renowned. Famous and renowned. You know the devil does not waste time on the privates and the corporals. You remember that passage? in the Acts of the Apostles when the devil wasn't going to waste his time. Who are you? Who are you? I'm not going to waste my time on you. I'm after those who are in places of leadership. And that's exactly what we're witnessing in this day in which we're living. Their accusation was, I'm talking about those who assisted Korah, their, their accusation was based on this. You take too much upon yourselves. Too much. So the rebellion was against God's appointment of Moses and Aaron. They were the leaders. It was true that all who were Israelites were separated from the standpoint of position. That's why I said you're all holy. You're all holy. But they could not all be appointed to be officers of Moses and Aaron. 
so the devil knows how to make a few good statements, good statements, to cover the real motive that he has in mind. Well, we'll go further. Equality under the laws of God is no excuse for defying the God-ordained proclaimers of those laws. So those who cry equality are the very ones who would overthrow the very laws that are being proclaimed. And we see that taking place today. I'm talking about assemblies, folks. We've got to see where the problem really lies. The persons of whom God approved in this crisis during the time of Moses and Aaron were those against whom the assembly gathered. So there are two important lessons to be learned from this incident in the life of Israel. Number one, it is humbling. Because it reveals the fickleness of human nature. And secondly, it is instructive because it reveals the righteous government of God. And we know what happened to Korah, don't we? We know what happened to him. The different calls for help are recorded in Joshua chapter 10. Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, had heard about Joshua's destruction of Ai and how the people of Gibeon had made peace with Israel. And think about the people who are making peace with a lot of institutions today that call themselves religious institutions. So the king had a good name, Adonai Zedek. What was his name? feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city. Adonai Zedek could not stand for the Gibeonites to desert their ranks to join the Lord's host. Therefore he called for the kings of Hebron. Watch this. Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon to help attack Gibeon. On the other hand, the men of Gibeon knew about the intended attack. And they called upon Joshua to come and deliver us and help. So a great spiritual lesson is to be learned from this incident in the Old Testament. The person who by grace departs from evil always makes himself or herself a prey. I said a prey. P-R-E-Y. And that means you're going to have a problem. You're going to have to face some foes. So his foe may be his past friends who now become his enemies. And they even may be from your own household. You remember those incidents in the New Testament where the Lord warned about even your household? Your worst enemy may be someone in your own household. Matthew 10, 34, if you want the verse. So as the Gibeonites put their trust in Joshua for help, the Christian puts his trust in his Joshua, the Lord Jesus Christ. He alone can help. Now let's look how the Lord controls everything. But there are a lot of people today who do not believe that the Lord controls the elements. He controls everything in what is called human nature. And we'll look at that. We find in Joshua 10 and verse 13, the sun stood still. 
the sun stood still. The various ways and means by which God governs the universe demonstrate His freedom and His sovereignty. It is important <clears throat> to observe that miracles do not follow a certain course. Now I want us to slow down here on this one a little bit. I'm having a little difficult time talking anyway. <clears throat> so let me kind of make this one, two, three so we can get this point. I said providence is a continuous miracle. Talk about miracles? Providence is a miracle. Which sometimes makes use of number one, means. Means. M-E-A-N-S. And yet, it must be understood that God is free to work without means. He doesn't always use means. And thirdly, above means. And I'll go on to say even against means. Now let me go back and state that again. Providence is a continuous miracle which sometimes makes use of means, and yet it must be understood that God is free to work without means, above means, and against means. And I'm going to give you some examples of these. Paul <clears throat> certainly gives us some good statements in working above means, Paul said concerning Abraham in Romans 4.19, And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Now, think about that. So, in working above means. Now, and then he works with means. Let's look at another example. In working above means, I gave you the passage in Romans 4.19. Now, let's look again. In working against means... Daniel said concerning the three Hebrews, Daniel 3.27, And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors, being gathered together, saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was an hair of their head singed, neither were their courts changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. The king of Babylon issued a mandate for all the subjects of his kingdom to worship the image set up in the plain of Dura. However, by grace, the three Hebrew children, as they are referred to, would not worship the image. They wasted no time in giving their answer. Daniel 3, 16 through 18. It has been said, unawed by the presence of the king, and I like the word unawed, and unaffected, and I like the word unaffected, by the terrors of the fiery furnace, the faithful men refused to bow down and worship the image. The presence of the fourth person. And the fourth person was none other than the Lord Jesus himself. Like the Son of God, kept the fire from having any power over the faithful men. Thus, what appeared to be their demise became another great victory. The wicked are to be pitied rather than feared. Folks, 
That takes faith. Not human faith, but God-given faith. Now let's look at something else. Such expressions as nature. That's a common expression today, nature. And the laws of nature, another common expression. These have been coined by persons who have no knowledge of providence. Let's let that soak in. Any time a person talks about nature and the laws of nature, he has coined those statements because he has no understanding of providence. Christians do not believe that the universe is like a vast machine which runs involuntarily, necessarily, and uniformly. God is as active in providence as he is in creation. It is interesting to observe that the so-called laws of nature are being continually modified. Have you noticed that? For example, why are there such marked variations in the seasons? The seasons are not always the same. Even the fall is not the same one year as it is the next year. And winter is not the same one year as it is the next year. And we know there's a difference and a variation in the four seasons. So, why is there such disparity between summer and summer, fall and fall, winter and winter, spring and spring? You know, our trees are already budding. I see flowers already coming forth. That didn't happen last year at this time. So each new season is obviously controlled by a particular providence of God. I said by a particular providence of God. I want to quote a couple of Puritans. Charnock made this statement. Listen to it. Quote, It is as easy for God to turn nature out of its settled course as it is to place it in the station it holds and the course it runs. End of quote. Just as easy. Just as easy. Listen to Robert Haldane. He said, and I quote, to affirm that a suspension or alteration of the laws of nature is impossible is to confer on them the attribute of deity and to declare that they are supreme and having no superior precludes the existence of God as well as miracles or it represents him as subordinate to his own laws. End of quote. Folks, pretty serious to make a wrong, unbiblical statement, isn't it? Pretty serious. One must not think that God is the Creator, that God the Creator has brought into existence a system or instituted such laws that ties His hands. His hands are not tied. I remember at the close of World War II, a lot of statements were being made about the atomic bomb. Glenn Cole told a good one this morning before the service, talking about a fellow up where he was raised. He said after the war, talking about the atomic bomb, he was sitting on one of these benches in the little town, you know, where they spit and whittle. And uh, he wanted to tell them what he thought. He said, you know what? 
God has brought into being an automatic bomb <laughs> that has no control when it's turned loose. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. He didn't know atomic. He wasn't pronouncing it correctly. He brought into being. So here we brought into being an automatic bomb that knows no control, has no control when it has been turned loose. Well, I remember hearing, we have now developed something over which when it's turned loose, we have no control. Folks, God has not brought anything into being that he does not control. That's how simple it is. He sustains everything. He controls everything. Don't forget our text. Psalm 135 and verse 6. So it's wonderful to know that God is supreme. And being supreme, He is in control. So one has made this statement. Quote, What is called the course of nature the course of nature in quotation marks, is nothing but the direct agency of God. It could no more operate of itself than it could create itself. Hence the day God delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, He answered Joshua's prayer with a miracle. Every miracle is stupendous or it is not a miracle. God controls not only inanimate matter, but irrational creatures. Now, let's spend a little time thinking about irrational creatures. There are a lot of irrational creatures out there. So, thus making them serve His own purpose. The ravens were ordered by divine providence to feed Elijah. Calamities which befell nations touched the people of God who lived there. Even the people of God who lived there. God does not exempt His people always from experiencing some of the calamities that irrational people Unleash. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, Psalm 34, 19, but the Lord eventually delivers us out of them all. Oh yes, I may experience some unusual things in life, but I tell you what, I'm still going to be delivered out of them. And so will you as a Christian. Help comes to the people of God from the most unlikely sources. Hence they shall be saved if they only wait their turn. Elijah was fed from an unlikely source. Daniel was delivered from the den of lions by an unlikely source. Daniel's enemies could not demand his life after his release from the lion's den. They could not say there had been a miscarriage of justice. Therefore the king was as free from the charge of injustice as he was before Daniel was thrown into the pit. What appeared to the world to be destruction for two great servants of God turned into a glorious victory. Almost 2,000 years ago, God solved the greatest problem of all time. Do you know what it is? Do you know what it was that was solved at that time? That you are the blessings of it now? How could God remain just in justifying the unjust? 
No lawyer can give an answer. No man can give an answer. It is not found in any book, any religious book. It is found only in the book, God's book, the Bible. And we'll read a passage in closing, but not now. So, how could God remain just in justifying unjust men? We're all unjust. All of us unjust. How could God justify us and remain just in our justification? All right, let's look at this in closing. Something had to be done. With the sin problem that still exists as far as mankind is concerned. There is sin. And the sin problem has to be dealt with. The Son of God had to become the Son of Man. In order that the sons of men could become the sons of God. Satan has been busy against the Lord Jesus Christ since the very beginning. And when I say the beginning, I mean the beginning of all beginnings. He was instrumental in the fall of Adam. That's where we should start. But before that, when Lucifer fell, he was instrumental even in the heavens to have all of the non-chosen angels to follow him. I said non-chosen angels. So Satan has been busy against the Lord Jesus since the beginning. He was instrumental in the fall. He corrupted Cain. He slew Abel. He corrupted the race of mankind. Then sought to kill the infant Jesus Christ when he came into the world. Notice I said sought to kill him as an infant. However, the Bible says, They are dead which sought the young child's life. Matthew 2.20 There was a time for Christ to die. There was a way for Christ to die. And he would not die until his appointed time. And also the appointed means would put him to death. So they who run against the purpose of God always die. God's purpose prevailed. The devil was defeated. And Herod died. Little did proud Rome know. Little did cultured Greece imagine. Little did religious Israel suspect. Or Nazareth dream that in that small village was the God-man. The Lord Jesus, the eternal Son. The only one who could solve and did solve the sin problem. Where? At Calvary. At Calvary. The Savior knew that the time had come when His enemies were resolved to have His blood and God's appointed time was near. In the final minutes before Christ's death, the heavenly high priest, after the order of Melchizedek, stood before the earthly high priest after the order of Aaron. What a lesson there is in this, folks. When Christ announced himself as the Son of God, Caiaphas rent his clothes in mock horror. This put him out of the Levitical office. According to Leviticus 21.10, Leaving Christ, who has an unchangeable priesthood, as the only high priest, 
who offered himself once in the end of the age to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. In Christ's death, therefore, what appeared to be the, the God's greatest defeat was his greatest victory. And folks, there is another victory to be won. I personally believe we're living in the last days. And I want to give a little warning this morning. Most of the financial support of this little assembly presently is coming from the older people of this assembly. Did you ever think about that? Think it through. I don't know what the future holds, but I do say I do not see very many being called forth by the effectual call from young people today like there was even 25 years ago or 50 years ago, even up to 59 years ago when God effectually called me. It's kind of frightening. Folks, you've got to be realistic. I want us to have, and I think all of you who are older along with me, would like to see a local assembly left carrying on the message. But do you realize what a tremendous responsibility? In five years from now, what will it be like? In ten years from now, what will it be like here? What will it be like? I have to say, and I want to give, I want you to turn with me. I want to read it from the, the NASB. Turn to Second Thessalonians. I want to give this in closing this morning. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. This is a subject all its own, but I want to get to a certain passage of Scripture and see if this is not being fulfilled presently before our very eyes. I want to begin with the first verse. <clears throat> I want to stop with the 11th verse. Paul said, Now we request you, brethren with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him. That you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above every so called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God displaying himself as being God do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know that what restrains him now, so that in his time he may be revealed. What do you think is restraining his revelation now? Verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Now, the mystery of lawlessness was at work in Paul's time. It's worse now. Notice what he says. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth 
and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one who is coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved or delivered. Now this verse, look at the next one. And for this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence. I want to stop there a minute. I have never witnessed in my lifetime such a deluding influence as I'm witnessing today. I said deluding influence. So that they might believe what is false. Folks, these are sad days in which we live. I said sad. And people don't seem to have any concern. You know, when I saw the popularity of our president go up last week after all that we've heard for two weeks, the popularity going up, way up in the 70s, close to... I believe it's 78 percent was given the last I noticed. 78 percent. This passage came immediately to my mind. If verse 11 doesn't apply today, you tell me to what does it apply? So, folks, it's not going to get better. You say, well, you are a preacher of gloom. Uh-uh. I'm a preacher of hope. When I see this, then I lift up my eyes beyond and above it all. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Let's stand.